Uh, but you know, the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, we've been preaching. A few weeks ago, we had Pentecostal Sunday, and uh, this past week, Pastor Jeff challenged us to do what? You know, to teach our kids, amen, because they were a generation, we were a generation away from Pentecost being gone. And I don't know about you, but that was alarming to me. It was like an alarm going off as he was calling at the watchman on the wall. Uh, you know, he was, was talking about Joshua, you know, there, and I, and I have that in my notes today. But I, I want to get with you this morning, uh, you know, I want to speak to you on a subject, and I'm going to call it Ignite. Uh, and Melinda helped me out with the title because I'll be honest with you, I'm terrible at titles. Just, just confessing, that's the last thing I do to every sermon is give it a title. A lot of people are like, well, why don't you give it a title first? My thought process is so, so weird, excuse me for being so weird, but you know, when God, you know, I, I, I don't know, it's just weird. I, I just don't always have a title and I just always wait for the Lord to direct me. And, uh, you know, I, and I'll give you like a praise report for myself. I was praying and I said, God, why do you allow a guy like me? Why do you allow someone like myself to be able to get up and into the pulpit? I really don't feel worthy of being there. I just, it, it's always been something that I struggle with. And is it okay that I struggle with that? Don't we all, right? Amen. And God said to me and very clearly, he said, because you can go places that other people can't. You can go places. And I was like, you know, God, I never thought of it that way. And I got to thinking, you know, you know what direction is God taking me? What, what, what's he want me to do? Because how do you, many of you, do you know, one of the mo most prayed things that I always pray is God, give me direction. Always give me direction because you know what? If I'm walking on my own street and I'm not paying attention to where God's taking me, I'm probably not being a very good navigator of where I'm going. I just always trust and believe in him. But I want to read to you this morning, if you would, stand with me just one more time, if you would, please. As we read in God's word in the book of Acts, and many of you know this passage very, very well. We've probably read it a few times the last couple of weeks, but when I was preparing my sermon one of the things that God was, was speaking to me was, you know, was this passage and I couldn't get away from it. So I just want to read it and rehearse it in your hearing. It's on the PowerPoint, I'm sure, behind me. But it comes from the book of Acts. It starts in, you know, chapter 2 and starts with verse 38 and goes through 47. And here's what it says. It says, And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who were uh, gladly received his word and were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfast in their apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and, did, and divided them among all and anyone had, and as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's bow our heads as we repray one more time. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to get into your word. Lord, I ask you, Father, to be with me as I'm here preaching, God, as I'm sharing your word or your testimony of your faithfulness. Lord, I pray, God, that the, that the Holy Spirit walk up and down the aisles of this church, through every corner in children's church, God, in the nursery. Lord, be with every single person, individual that's listening, even there through the, via the internet. God, be with our pastor as he is there, he and Bonnie. Lord, give him peace and rest, knowing that the word of the living God is being spread throughout this church, God. But let it be anointed by you, God. Lord, be with us. Let us hear what you are saying to us, God. Let it penetrate into our hearts. And let us receive your word. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. First, I want to say, I forgot to mention this earlier, but last Sunday we had a baptismal and it was an awesome time. It was an awesome experience for myself. It was the very first time I got to do it 
per se, in the church setting with a group, a, a large group. Before I had done individuals, you know, we would go to Clear Spring on our missions trip. And one of the most awesome things on our missions trip is seeing guys like Caleb Lambert and Tanner and Victoria and other students, even some of our younger kids like Katie, they got to baptize. And I think Sierra may have baptized some younger children there, but it is an honor and a privilege. I want to say thank you to all of those who were baptized. I thought it was a great experience to be able to see you get up and profess your faith to everyone that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and I thought it was a great time for myself. But just speaking of the church today, the day of Pentecost came in this passage. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon all. Here Peter is preaching by the authority and with the boldness of the Holy Spirit. How many knows that we need the boldness of the Holy Spirit? His words seem to be blunt and to the point. That's why I always say, Brad Huddleston always said he was Paul. I said, I believe I was more like Peter. Sometimes I would say things before I think. I said said that in in, uh, Bible study a few times. I said, I felt more like Peter because sometimes he speaks before he thinks. And sometimes, you know, that's okay, right? Sometimes it's not so okay. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say that those who, were, were gladly, who gladly received his words were baptized, and there were 3,000 that were added to, the, to them. Now, every time I read that passage, every single time I get excited. I'm like, God, you mean we can preach your word and 3,000 people can get saved? That, to me, that's just astonishing to me. I'm like, man, if one person raises their hand for salvation in the church today, we're like, wow, that's amazing. Am I right? If one person goes, I I need to be saved or I want to receive Christ. That's why when when I speak with the EE folks and they go out into the community and they lead folks to the Lord, they always tell me it was the greatest thing ever. It was a great experience. When I see young people in youth ministry raise their hand for salvation, wow, wow. Wow, what a great day that is, right? There's, There's a new name written in glory. And you know, people get, we need to get excited when we hear about 3,000 souls. When you think of the church of Jesus, not only here was it getting getting started, it was now becoming vibrant and with the power of the Holy Spirit, the number started to grow. And its spiritual influence would start to spread like a wildfire. And that's why we titled it Ignite, because it would be like igniting a fire. There would be something spreading throughout that, that entire time. It was something new, but it was, it was refreshing and new because there was a new covenant, a new way to go to God, amen? When the church becomes active in fulfilling the, ministry, the mission of the gospel, it will produce change. When we are fulfilling or active, notice the word there, active, in fulfilling the mission of the church gospel, it will produce change. See, the message of Jesus, the message of his powerful works among the people and the resurrecting from the dead uh, was being taught by many and, and conversions were taking place all over. If, if you remember last year when we, we went through the book of Acts, excuse me, in our Bible study, the, those of you who come to Bible study on Wednesday evening, but also we went through, uh, you know, we watched the series AD and that was what it was based on, was the beginning of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was a new covenant, covenant between man and God. No longer did this gap between us look so hard to accomplish. It was now much easier, amen, because of what Jesus did. As we know, the way to approach him was not as simple. Uh, it was a lot simpler now because Jesus had died on the cross, resurrected, amen? And we know the way to approach him, uh, you know, was much easier. And, G- and Peter basically just said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of the sins, of your sins. That sounds pretty simple, amen? How many of you know that's how simple it is to receive Christ? How many of you can say that this morning? Say it with me. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. How easy is that to say? Now, you know, sometimes we make the, comp- we make the gospel so complicated when we get done speaking, people are like, what in the world is he talking about? Sometimes I think we complicate the thing, right? We're like, you have to, you know, I mean, didn't the scribes and Pharisees do a great job at that? Didn't they make it so complicated? People are like, what? <laughs> You know, and, and it was, they were, they were following the law, amen? They were following the original law, but there's a new law, amen? Jesus came, you know, he came and he conquered all that. And he changed all that and made it much easier. Sounds like it was made for a TV movie, right? On how the rules of engagement would look so different. 
It was so different. Even the scribes were like, we don't, it's so much easier now. And they, they didn't even accept it in many cases. On how to attain the remission of our sins, it was all changed in one act of a man God named Jesus Christ. The fact that, that he existed from the beginning, and you can find that in John, as a prince of God in heaven, he was born as a man in the flesh, and of course that's in Matthew 2, 1. He was wounded and beaten, and you can read that in 1 Peter 2, 24, and his blood in 1 John 4, 7 was spilled out, giving us healing and redemption. You know the healing that uh, you know, Eddie was talking about earlier? I truly believe when I'm praying with someone that Jesus Christ is healing them at that moment. When I go to someone and I, and I will lay hands on them to pray, I don't do that frivolously and go, okay, I just think maybe he will, maybe he won't. I'm thinking Jesus is going to heal you in, because it's his healing that's taking place, not mine. My hands are flesh. If I cut one of my fingers off, it would be gone and it would hurt like the dickens. But I'm telling you because of Jesus and his extension through us because of our faith in him, he will heal people, amen? And we're starting to see those greater things accomplished for his glory. Because it has to be for his glory, not for man's glory. When you see man taking credit, you better turn the TV off, amen? I'm just saying, if, if man's receiving glory for those type things, it's not of God because God receives the glory, not man, or Christ receives the glory. He also died an unimaginable death on the cross, uh, but where the story really changes, he rose back to life, amen? And after three days in a tomb that was made for burial, it was left empty, he left it empty, amen, he, he rose from the dead, during which he ascended into hell and he claimed dominion over death back from the thief of the devil, who was Satan. And, he, and after a, a time here on earth, ascended into heaven as a glorious conquering Savior and Lord, of which he is now in an intercession for you in heaven to our Father. Now, how many times have we heard that before? Many, many times, right? But that's a nutshell of the gospel. That's the gospel and the message that we, we wanna give hope to people. This is the message that the disciples were teaching and they were preaching in 3,000 souls. The first time Peter got up with a boldness and spoke, 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom. Now you can say, well, yeah, but that was a little bit different because, you know, the gospel hadn't really been spread out. True, true. But you know what's amazing to me? You know, there are revivals taking place in our country and in our nation, uh, more so in other nations, amen? Like, you know, I've, I've had other people tell me this. It's not something that I'm aware of, but they're telling me, you know, I go to district council and I hear Brad Huddleston or different uh, friends of mine that are, are evangelists are telling me in other nations, they're experiencing revival and many souls are coming to know Christ. They're hearing the message of Jesus. When you consider the state of the church today, we all, you know, I can sit here and give you, a, you know, statistics. I can give you uh, just about anything you want to hear on the state of the church. But how many of us know that we're in a state of emergency? We really are. Pastor Jeff's, you know, our focus, our direction, our numbers, our missions, our goals are all out of order. And, you know, as our pastor, as we mentioned earlier, spoke last week about the power that the Israelites, they had experienced under the leadership of Joshua. Simply, Joshua was following the model that Moses had set before him. And Joshua had seen the faithfulness of God, right? As many times as even when, when Moses held the staff over, the, over the, you know, the Red Sea and said, you know, see the glory of the Lord and the waters parted, amen. He had seen things like that. How many of you know that when we see great things happen like that, God will receive the glory. Amen. And I'm trusting and believing that we're not through with it yet. We're not dead yet. I mean, the people are kicking us when we're down and thinking we're dead, but the church still is vibrant and alive. Maybe not on the level that we wish, but it's still, it still, you know, dwells within you. The Holy Spirit still dwells within you. The next generation, of course, we as Pastor Jeff talked about, you know, uh, there in Joshua uh, had, did not know the Lord. They simply had not been brought up in the ways of God like the previous generation. So in turn, they were ignorant to his direction. They just did, did not have direction. Now, I will not make any bones about it. Am I perfect when it comes to youth ministry? No. Am I the best in the country? According to most standards, probably not. According to a lot of standards, what you would consider a, an awesome youth pastor, I probably fail in many areas. But one thing I will not do and I hope you're okay with this. I'm not going to compromise the gospel just to fill seats. I'm not going to tell you it's okay to do something 
just because it will get you to come to church. Amen. Now I'm going to trick them into coming to church with other things. Like I'll say, hey man, we're having an awesome service tonight. We got the, you know, hooked up band. We got all, and, and that's going to bring them in. But, but what's going to keep them is the power of the Holy Spirit drawing them. Amen. Because if they're being drawn by me, they're going to be sadly mistaken because I can give them nothing, but Christ can give them all things. Amen. When you really think about it, we are on the brink, we could be potentially on the brink of extinction as the Spirit-filled church if we don't really begin to get our houses in order. Um, our life of being on the uh, spiritual move is in jeopardy if we continue to fall short. I mean, it just really is. I know Pastor Jeff preached on it last week. I, I don't know what got into me Wednesday. Maybe it was the cup of coffee that I had, but I was preaching in my, in my office on Wednesday and the girls were trying to get stuff done and Christy and Victoria are like, shut up. And, and I'm like, it's coming out. I'm like, I need to preach this on, on, on Sunday. And they're like, save it for Sunday. And, and, but God was just really pressing on me to, to really bring the gospel message to you this morning. You know, today I want to discuss why the church has lost it. We, th that was originally a title I was going to talk about. I was like, you know what? We really haven't lost it, but we're on the brink of losing it. Our flame is going out. It's almost to an ember. We look like an ember in some cases, and if you will. And you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how uh, there's another pastor in our area that is preaching a sermon similar to this one this morning, and he had no clue I was preaching about basically the same title, almost the same words, almost, I don't know what scripture he was drawing it from, but I read it and uh, I sent him a message and I said, I pray that the Holy Spirit just use you this morning and let God's people awaken. Amen. We just need to come awaken and become alive. If we examine ourselves and our American church and even our individual churches of today, and it will help us identify where we need to do in order to see our church, churches become vibrant. I mean, all of us can, I mean, we could all sit down and give a master plan of that, right? We would say we need to pray more. We need to spend time in the word more. Amen. All of those things are important. Now, I want you to examine yourself. And this is not in my notes. This is just something off, off the cuff. I want you to consider thinking about you know, how much time do I really spend in God's word every week? Because if you don't have the sword of this, right? This is our sword. And when the enemy comes, what do we do? We quote scripture against him. Get behind me, Satan. Amen. If we don't have that tucked away in our heart, what does the scripture say? It's so we won't sin against God. You know, we want to have the spirit. We want to have that, that scripture tucked away. How much time do we really spend? When Eddie said earlier, he said, you know, sometimes we go to God as our last resort. Rather than going to him first with a need, we go to everyone else and then we go to God. Isn't that kind of backwards in how it should be? We should say, God, we come to you first against cancer. We come to you, God, against this, uh, you know, whatever this inf inflammation is. God, we come to you, you know, in the name of Jesus and I receive healing because because of who you are, God, not because of who I am, but who you are. And you know, I believe that when we go to God in those ways, it's scriptural. In scripture, you know, people were healed, amen, because they called upon the name of Jesus. They went to him and said, you know, Lord, Savior, we, we are asking for you to help us. You know, when the centurion went to him and said, you know, my child is sick, you know, things happen. God healed people, amen. When the when they let the, the four gentlemen let the, the, the person down that was lame in the bed through the roof of the, what happened when Jesus? anointed and prayed for them and touched them. They were healed. The woman with the issue of blood, when she touched only the hem of Jesus' garment, she was healed. Why not you? Why not me? Amen. Why do we have to stand defeated all the time? Why do we have to feel like that the devil's got a, a huge baseball bat and saying, I've got control. And we're standing there going, God, what do I do? What do I do here? And, and we're like, oh, you have to do that. I say, Satan, get off of me. Get behind me. Get away from me. I stand firm on the word of God. You know, that, I mean, truly, that's what it's going to take. First of all, the acts of the church should be recognized by everyone. The acts of the church should be recognized by everyone. How do we identify the power at work in the churches? And it's amazing. Eddie actually mentioned a little bit of it, you know, with some signs and wonders, things going on. First, they must see the fruits of the Spirit at work in the believers. If they're not seeing the fruits working in us, what do we have to offer? Amen. If we're walking around going, we, we, we just don't know what to do. You just have to come and find out. You know, I, I just, it, it puzzles me because, you know, I've been there. 
Amen? I, I mean, that's not being con- you know, condemning to anyone, but sometimes I get in that state. I feel like, you know, the devil is, is getting one over on me. But we need to be revealing the fruits at work in us for the church to be effective. We, first of all, we need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, which is, you know, elementary, amen? It's el- we, obvious we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. As Brother Mayhem preached a couple weeks ago, fire showed up in my bones, and he's preached that, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the believers. If you read in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ to John, there are seven churches that are mentioned there, and I'm going to identify them with you this morning. Now, we did a Bible study, and I think those of you who come to Wednesday night Bible study, just putting a plug in for you, if you don't come to Wednesday night Bible study, I'm telling you, you're missing out. I gained so much knowledge in that class. It is amazing. I'm just telling you, on Wednesday nights, if you can at all possible come out to Wednesday nights, I love it. I love coming to Wednesday Bible study and Wednesday evening, and I know on Wednesday mornings when Benny and Judy and the rest of the crew is there putting on the, the Bible study is awesome. I mean, God is speaking, you know, it's just amazing, but we studied the seven churches one time, and uh, we went through this same uh, kind of analogy, and I want to I rehearse it to you this morning. First is the church of Ephesus, and they called, it's called the Loveless Church. And the charge that they had against them was that they had left their first love. Now, you understand that the revelation to John was was the revelation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't John just feeling good about himself and decided to write it down. It's because there was a revelation given to him from Jesus himself. Amen? So John is writing down what he's being told here. You understand, if you read the book of Revelation, it says that right in there. Please write these things down. All right? I mean, do we all agree on that, that that's what that book is all about? It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and not, and have found them liars, and yet have preserved and have patience. You have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have against this against you. You have left your first love. They had left their first love. Excuse me. Of course, the church in Smyrna, it's the persecuted church. It says, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and that you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. Wow. Man, I don't know about you. Uh, the church of Paragamos, it was the compromising church. I won't read it, but you, you can understand. They were in compromise. They compromised everything. Uh, the church of uh, Thyatira, uh, nevertheless, I have found a few things against you because you allowed the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. It's the corrupt church, amen? Uh, also, uh, the church in Sardis, It's the dead church. It says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are are ready to die. They're ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. The dead church. Then the church of Philadelphia, the faithful church. It says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Amen? For you you have a little strength have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have not denied my name. You've kept my word. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And you, uh, and to you know that I have loved you. See, that was the, the faithful church, the faithful church there. And of course, uh, the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, and we've studied that. That's, I've probably heard more sermons on that church than any church, amen? The lukewarm church, and what does it say in Scripture? Because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you or spit you or vomit you out of my mouth. The church of today, in many ways, looks like the loveless church. We love everything else first, and God is on standby until we decide we need Him, or we don't extend our love, you know, in some ways to others. Also, we're the compromising church, and we have became tolerant in that sin actually looks like, and what sin looks like, and we have infiltr- um, we have uh, what it actually looks like, and we are engaged in it, so change seems to uh, defy our lifestyle. In other words, we don't want to change because we're in the middle of it. 
just you know, because we've compromised. The corrupt church, we see in the, it, the fact that sexual immorality is hitting record highs, and it has now infiltrated the church. Of course, it's been there for a while. It's not something new. The church is becoming the dead church by the fact that we treat church as a social hall where we visit when we feel like it, and we treat it like a place of gathering to you know, for our, get our feel good on. Amen? I know this is hard preaching. Please bear with me. We have, the, we have been the lukewarm church for a long time. We're not hold, you know, hot or cold. We're wishy-washy in our views and our moral standards, and, and everything seems to be like we're not really sure it's jaded. The, church that Jesus, the churches that Jesus praised were the persecuted church and the faithful church. And when I was reading those, those scriptures, it, it was tough. I'll be honest with you. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, when I read about those churches, I'm like, it's not, it's not the glamour picture. It's not, how many of you think it's glamorous to read that passage and think, wow, you mean I got to go through that? When you look at the seven churches here, you can apply these in three ways. And we discussed this in our Bible study. You can look at the church of then, you can apply it to then in those times. You can apply it to the church of today. But here's where it really hits home. You can apply it to you as an individual. You start reading those passages and go, okay, how am I like this church or not like that church? How am I, how do I fit this or not fit that, right? You start examining yourself individually. The apostle Paul writes in Romans 5, 1 through 4, he said, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Amen? Through all of that perseverance, we are going to, it helps us. Hey, how many of you know that if you, if you persevere, it may take a while, and perseverance also produces character, and, and, and you know, character gives hope. I, I know I've been through situations, and I'm like, God, you know, why am I going through this? God, why is this happening? Why is, you know, why am I going? And then at the end of it, I'm like, God, you were building my character. You were building me up. I was learning, I was persevering. And you know, what does Jesus say to the seven churches? He said, you know, I will give you a crown of life. I will have something in heaven for you. And I mean, he's saying that, I, you know, your treasures are in heaven. It doesn't say that in Revelation, but, but that's what he's saying there. He's saying that I have something greater for you. Amen. It may not, you may not see it on this earth. And that's hard for us. How many of us, uh, I know us guys, when we build something, what do we like to do at the end of the day? Guys, especially wives, I, I don't know how your brains work, but I know how guys work. But we like to look back and go, wow, look what I got done. Right? Sometimes you may not see all that you have accomplished when you're working in the kingdom of God because sometimes you don't see it the way God sees it. You may walk into heaven and God will say, here's what I did and here's what happened. When you were praying all those times, here's what was going on. You know the times you used to get up and, and pray and the times that you would read scripture and you would speak? There was this person that you worked with, you didn't even know that it was impacting them. You know, and there's going to be many, many stories like that. You know, this morning we were in, in Sunday school, we were talking about, uh, we're going to start this new th thing in our youth group where we're going to, it's called telling a story. And you start to just tell a story. And you're like, well, where do you start at? Well, I don't know. We just started telling stories. It's amazing the things that happen when we're telling those stories. And I believe when we get into heaven, I, I hope that God allows us to tell stories. I hope God allows me to sit down with Bill or, or sit down with, you know, with anyone, my wife or whoever, or CL, and just talk about, you know, man, I remember on earth, you know, we were going through this and, you know, I don't know that that's scriptural, but I just hope that God allows me to do that. First of all, they have to see, you know, for us to make an impact, the acts of the church have to be witnessed. They have to see it. Also, the impact of the church will be evident by how we respond. The impact of the church will be evident on how we respond. The church shouldn't be a place, uh, should be, shouldn't be a place, uh, it should be a place where lives are changed, right? It should be a place, the church should be, should be a launching pad for raising up disciples of Jesus to the world so that they can infiltrate and begin working in the mission that Jesus has called us into. That's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be spending our, it's not a, it's not a landing, a landing pad for the complacent. It should be a launching pad. We should be sending people out, amen? What did Jesus do with the 70? 
What does it say here? It says that in Luke 10 2, it says, Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. He didn't say just get together and just hang out and don't do anything, right? He didn't say just everybody come together on Sunday morning and just come together as a group, talk a little bit about God, read some scripture, sing a couple songs and go home. He said, go out. He said, I want to send you out. See, I believe that that's where the church has failed for so many years is to evangelize to the lost. It's almost like we're comfortable with being comfortable. Amen. It's almost like we're looking for God. Well, God, we, we have this awesome church. We have, and I'm not just speaking of the building, okay? I'm talking about, yes, it does include the building, but you know, there are many, many churches in our community. There's many churches in our district. And you know, we have people going in on Sunday mornings. Am I stepping on anyone's toes? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, as a, as a leader, uh, you know, in our church, you know, we have got to get this thing right. Amen. We have, there's no second chance at it. I mean, everybody's like, oh, you only live once. That's true. You do only live once, but you live twice actually. But you know what I'm saying? You only live as a human once, right? So, you know, when, when, I, when, when Tanner and even when my kids were younger, I'm like, they're like, I want to try out for baseball or whatever. Yeah, go ahead. You only live once. You only get one shot at it. We only get one shot at getting it right. We only get, maybe only get one shot at leading someone to the Lord that may drive away from us and we may never see him again. We may only have one shot at this community to turn it around for Jesus. You know, I'm encouraged and I've spoken this several times about the kid in, in West Virginia who, who started a revival in his school and it has like taken over. Please, please, one of you do that. Please, please, one of the teenagers in here, get a hold of your school. Get a hold of your school and start a revival. You want to see, you want to see a rocking school. Don't, don't, it doesn't matter how many state championships you win in football or, or soccer and hot, whatever other sports you play, right? I was about to say hockey, but I don't even know if there's a hockey team within thousands of miles of us, maybe Minnesota. But I mean, but you know what I'm saying? There are so many students that are walking up and down the halls of your schools that don't even know Jesus and have never really been taken to church to hear his word. If you read another scripture, the scribes were questioning why Jesus was eating with tax collectors. You know, sometimes people will question us on why we do things. Well, why would you do that? Why would you go out into your community? Why would you do that? I, I just don't understand why we would spend money to do that. Or I don't know why we would waste our time with that. We got it wrong if we're thinking that way. It says in Mark 2, 17, it says, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Amen. He went to reach out to the sinner. You've, you know the scripture where he says, I'll leave the 99 to go get that one. And I think maybe someone had mentioned it, maybe Pastor Jeff last week. Can you imagine leaving the, the fold to go get that one? I just love it when, when people say, man, I, I led a guy to the Lord. When I would go with Gerald and he would lead someone to the Lord. You know, I'm starting to sit now, and, and it's funny. When, when someone's our waiter, uh, my son picks up on this pretty well. He, he calls them invisible people. He calls them invisible people, but not because they're invisible, because he looks at them invisible, but they are people. You know, when you're at a restaurant and someone's waiting on you, that's a person. That's a soul that needs to know Jesus, amen? When you go to the counter, or, you know, when you go to Walmart to buy your groceries and that person is, is scanning your stuff through, that is a soul that needs to know Jesus. Now, they may know Jesus, but you know what? They may not. And you're like, you mean I need to talk to them about the Lord? Um, that's a little nerve wracking, right? The church will only be productive in whatever we're focused on. If we're not focused on lost souls, and let me tell you, uh, you've ever heard the term, you are who you are? Have you ever heard, it is what it is, or you are who you are? You know, you know Christy had mentioned this, that there's some complacency in that term, it is what it is. You know, there's like a lack of, of urgency, so to speak, in that. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, he said, he said beware, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes for thorn, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, what does it say? 
It is cut down and thrown into a fire. Therefore, by the fruits, you will know them. And that's how they will know us. If we are bearing good fruit, when we go into our community, when we are bearing good fruit, when they see the the mighty hand of God moving in our lives, there's something that people are going to like and be attracted to about that. When you go up to someone, I just know from years past, people who are very encouraging or people who are talking about what God has done in their life. How many of you love to hear someone say, boy, God is so good to me? He has changed my life or, or God. But how many of you like to hear, well, things aren't so good. I'm just really, it's not, you know, I don't know. Come on, church. Come on. Do we not sometimes fall into that category? I, I'm right there with you. It's not just you. I'm preaching to me. Sometimes I talk about the things that are bad more than I talk about the faithfulness of God and what he's done in my life. I get so hung up on the bad stuff, I'm not even focused on Jesus who's standing on the other side saying, come on, dummy, hurry up. Get over here. I'm waiting on you to get through this so we can move on to the next thing. And we're standing there going, I mean, it, 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 it's true, amen? I mean, sometimes we're so focused on the bad stuff. That's funny right there, right? Who wants to ignite a fire? Who wants to ignite a flame? Who wants to get a fire going in our community and in our church that burns so bright that when people drive by, they're like, oh my Lord, what's going on at that church? There is shouting and there's praising God. They're marching around this. They're marching outside the church. What's going on? It's, the, it's Jericho all over again. I remember as a kid when we used to do Jericho marches. How many remember those? We need another Jericho march. I'm not saying we go back. It's not what I'm preaching here. I'm not saying we go back and relive it. I'm saying that we just need to ignite. We need to look at scripture where 3,000 souls were saved. There were signs and wonders. That's how we're going to be identified as the church is when they see changes and they see works of God. You know, if we're just walking around like everybody else going, you know, we're living like everyone else. What are we giving them? What are we offering? Amen? What are we showing them? The vibrant church should never be looked at by the amount of money that we have in our account or how many people are in the seats or by how big the building is, we can only measure our success in our ability to spread and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are not communicating that, if we are, when Pastor Jeff and I get up here to preach, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, Pastor Jeff is such an awesome pastor. Sometimes I get really nervous when I preach near him because I'm like, man, he's like really good. And I'm like, not really very, all that well. You know, he's, he's like really good. But you know what? When you preach the word of Jesus, it doesn't, I've heard people get up and preach for five minutes and people get saved, right? Because they're effectively spreading the gospel of Jesus into someone's life. You know, a few weeks ago when we had people come up for the anointing of the baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Holy Spirit, I believe that every single person in here should be standing up at this altar. I believe that when we, when, when, you know, Eddie puts a call out for somebody to come up for prayer, I'm telling you, if you have a need in your body, you need to come up for prayer. Not that my prayer is any better. You know what it does? It says that I'm willing to stand up. I'm willing to walk forward and say, Jesus, I believe in you so much that I don't care who sees me go up. I'm going to stand stand before you and I'm going to say, I want to receive healing today. And it's because by your stripes, I will be healed. And it's not because you're trying to put on a show. It's not because you're trying to gain attention to yourself. It's because you're trying to show Jesus that he is faithful. It's our faith in him. It's our faith in him. Are we experiencing, how about this? Are you experiencing a personal revival right now? Are you, I mean, we, we, we go through those, how many of you go through the valleys? How many of you have the, the, the trailer hooked behind you and it's, you're, you're like, oh man, not again. And, and sometimes they seem to come in waves, right? We need to overcome. There's a song, that you, be an overcomer. You know what? It's always e- easier to talk about being an overcomer than it is to actually go through it, right? I, I, I think of shows, you know, I think of, uh, you know, people in my life who say, like I have a sister who, who was really, really extremely heavy and, and she was really heavy in weight and she went on an extreme diet and she lost like 100 pounds, like boom, like that. And she was so proud of herself and she couldn't walk. My sister was so heavy, she couldn't even, she had fallen and broken her leg in several places and she couldn't walk. And my sister, I mean, excuse me, my daughter Taylor and I, every single night, every single night, because my daughter at nine years old, she gets on a prayer it's like, I can't stop her. She prays for it every night. And so every single night we prayed for my sister. And now here we are two years later and my sister is now walking 
She's up moving around. She had lost weight. But it took dedication on her part. It, the weight just didn't, she just didn't pray and the weight fell off of her. Amen? It's not like she said, God, I need this weight going and all of a sudden it just disappeared. She had to go through some, some things to get there. She had to persevere. She had to overcome. She had to give up some of the things she was eating. She had to get up and move. Amen? We need to get up and move this morning. We need to start thinking about what God is going to do and stop thinking about what the devil's going to do. Because we know, we already know he's out to destroy, kill, and steal everything that we own, not just possessions, but our, our lives, amen? It's our spiritual lives he wants to steal. He wants to steal everything that God has given to you internally. We as the church have been so distracted for so long, we have forgotten what vibrant looks like. I mean, we do, we, we do. I mean, when we have a service that blows people away, come on, church. When we have a church that's vibrant and alive and the Spirit of God is moving, we get so excited. How many of you were so excited two weeks ago when Gerald got up and preached his heart out and he starts spitting Scripture? That dude can throw him out faster. He should be in a fast-talking contest when it comes to preaching sermons, amen? Because he throws them out faster than you can, than you can, you can blink. And he, you know, it's so exciting when I'm up here and one of the blessings it is for being in ministry is when I see brothers and sisters in the Lord, and I could start naming you. I could start, when you be, get into ministry, you'll understand this. Most of you that are in ministry or have been involved in ministry know what I'm talking about. When you see others in your congregation who you pray for, and you know some of the needs in their lives, and you see God touching them, let me tell you something, nothing warms my heart more than to see Matthew Allen, who's getting ready to go to the military, who got up here and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and power of God in his life, who I know has things in his life that trouble him, and he got up here and says, I'm gonna give my all to him. And when I see things like that happen, there's no greater reward. There's no greater, greater reward in ministry than that. The other, the, another great reward is whenever you come up to Pastor Jeff and say, I feel, Pastor, I was healed. Pastor, something changed in my life. When people walk in that door and they are broken and they are beat down and they feel like they have nowhere to turn and they feel like that, they, that the only next step is, is they feel like there's nothing worth living for and they feel like that the devil has came against them with so many things and God turns them around and starts pointing them in the right direction. That is the greatest thing to ever see happen. Now, that's the, that's the same fire that we need to ignite on everyone in this building. Because when we start to get that desire, I believe that we're gonna see so many souls saved for the kingdom of God that, it's, that, that the building won't hold everyone, amen? amen? Let me move on for sake of time. I've been preaching way too long. I heard this in a seminar and I felt like it needed repeating. And I've said this to several of the students before and maybe some of the leaders as well. It said, the gentleman that was teaching this was like a, has a doctorate degree in leadership. I don't know how you get that, but he has one. He from Southeastern University, and he said, really intelligent guy, so intelligent, such a dynamic speaker. He's going to be the week three speaker at youth camp this year, and I'm sorry that I'm going to miss him. But he said, if you focus on something for one hour per day for 20 years, that you will be an expert at it. You will be an expert so think about it. If we are in God's word for one hour every day, or we're praying to God for one hour every day for 20 years, you're an expert at it. How many experts do we have here? Amen. How many experts do we have? Now, that's not to beat you up. You understand. It's to challenge you. It's to challenge you to be faithful to get up and, you know, in the mornings and, and to pray to God and, uh, you know, look at the fruits. What fruits are we producing? Have we become, you know, one of the five churches in the book of Revelation where it talks about complacency? You know, I, I read an illustration and I told my wife, I promised I was not going to use any illustrations this morning. I was just going to get into the meat of the word and that was it. And, I, and I'm going to hold to that, sweetie. I'm not going to give my illustration. But complacency has set in for so, so long. The fear, when you, when you read in Scripture, it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Many signs and wonders were done. Now, that's the vibrant church. 
We need to have this fear. You know, and, and when, it, when it talks about that fear, the revelation of the church will, be sh- will show, you know, where we're focused. When we start to get that revelation, it, it will start to show where we are focused. When it says, it's not, it's not a, uh, a fear, um, the fear that we think of of being afraid, but one of reverence, authority to a holy God. In other words, godly fear is not one of trembling for your life. You're not sitting there shaking and trembling for your life. It's the one of reverence to the holy creator by way of offering respect. When you start to respect in a fearful way, amen? When you start to say, God, I am sold out to you in fear, not fear of being afraid of God, but saying, God, because of respect that I have for you and the fact that I know that you are seated on the throne and the fact that I know that you're right there and and Jesus, you're right there in intercession for me and the fact that you died on the cross. And when you start to say, I'm gonna do whatever I can to reach as many souls as I can, no matter what it takes, no matter what sacrifice it takes. It goes on into 44 and 47. It says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continued, uh, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They were, there was everything was, they were just hanging out. They were having a great time together, praising God, amen, and having favor with all the people they were getting favor And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Daily people were being added to the church. You mean there's that word sacrifice? You know that we, for some reason, uh, they sold their possessions and and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. That's, I mean, you just know it's not the same. I mean, yeah, we have a, let me just go on record and tell you, our church is a very giving church. You're a very giving church. But I, I believe there's more to that in sacrifice. Another word is fellowship. They continued daily in the temple, breaking of bread from house to house, ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and had favor with the people. What what happened after that? The Lord added to the church. See, when we start to do those things, the Lord starts to add to the church. When we start to truly reach out, excuse me, when we truly start to, to, you know, listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us, when we start to follow his direction, when we start to do those things, the Lord will add to the church daily. Are we going to be at Ignite, a church that comes alive? It will require sacrifice for the church of Jesus Christ to rise out of this time of desperation. It will require sacrifice. It's going to require giving it all you have. Now, I don't know. I, I mean, most of you here probably have worked or have a job or, or have had children and you've had to work. How many of you can say that you've sacrificed? As young people, you know, when, we, when Trina and I first got married, we had so many things. We talked to our children about it this week. We went to Virginia Beach for a couple of days, <clears throat> you know, to get away for our anniversary. And I was telling my son, I said, I can remember when your mom and I were, were first married and we would, we would sacrifice certain things. Like we wouldn't go out to eat as much or, or we wouldn't go out to eat at all. Or we wouldn't buy a lot of new things because we had to sacrifice. We had to sacrifice to be able to, to, you know, to save money, to be able to pay things off. So we didn't feel like that, you know, that we were in such a desperate place. And I feel like that, you know, even today in our church, we're going, to, we're going to need to sacrifice. We're going to need to give up of our time. We're going to need to give up of ourselves. We're going to have to do things that we wouldn't normally feel comfortable with doing, amen, to reach a lost and dying world. In 2 Corinthians, I'll read 6, 1 through 10 and 17 through 18, and then I will, I will close. It says, we then as workers together with him also pleaded with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now it is the time, now is the acceptable, accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We have no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we command ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonment, in in tumults, which is in turmoil, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings by purity, by knowledge, by longsuffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, 
and honor and dishonor by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live as chastened, chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Therefore, come out from, uh, from among and be a separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, is this what the church wants to be remembered for? Is this what we really want to be? Or do we want to be the defenseless church? Do we want to be the helpless church? Do we want to be the incapable church? Do we want to be known as the ineffective church? Do we want to be known as the paralyzed church? Do we want to be known as the passive church? Do we want to be known as the vulnerable church? Or do we want to be known as the powerless church? See, that's what the devil has, has tried to do. He's tried to make us all of those things. He wants us to be passive, powerless, vulnerable, paralyzed. He wants to lock us down to where we are so paralyzed in fear that we sit quietly. We, we, we do our church, we're, we're like this. We're like, our, neighbor, our neighbors don't even know. Our neighbors don't even know that we serve Christ. Our friends and family are like, man, I didn't even know. I didn't even know because it didn't, I really didn't hear you know, anybody say anything. For the church of Jesus Christ to rise out of this time of desperation, it will require sacrifice and will for your troubles, you will experience persecution. You will see a persecution. But in the end, we can complete the mission of seeing the kingdom of heaven filled with souls. I don't know about you, but there's a desire to see many, many souls come to know Jesus. I want everybody to, do, even this morning, to even now, just begin to bow your heads. And listen, I just want you to understand that God is calling us to be a church, a changed church. As, as Wes puts on the song, I want to just rehearse in your hearing. It says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. This morning is, we come to a close in this service. I want you to examine where you stand. Where are you with the Lord right now in your current state? Father, we uh, honor, praise to you, God, this morning. Lord, we just receive, God, whatever it is that you are saying to us, Father. Lord, as the church of today, God, moves into our, you know, even to the, the, the remainder of the time that we have before you would come back. Lord, that you would shake us from the very core, Lord. And Father, we would receive direction, Lord, from you, Holy Father, that we would have a, a desire to preach your word to everyone that we come in contact with, Lord, that we would be changed from the inside, that there would be a, a fire that burns within our spirit, God, that souls would come to know you. If you're here this morning and you would say, you know, Pastor Trevor, I need, I need Jesus in my life. You know, I, I strayed and I once knew the Lord and, you know, this morning, I just want to make it right with Him. I just want you to slip your hand up and slip it back down real quick. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's not a time of embarrassing. It's between you and the Lord. Do you feel maybe the Lord's tugging at your heart? And you feel like you need Jesus in your heart as your Lord and personal Savior? I encourage you this morning. Just slip your hand up real quickly and then put it back down. If that's you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what? I've lost my desire. Sometimes I feel like the churches that you mentioned earlier. If that's you this morning, I want you to just in your own self, right where you sit. I want you to begin to seek the Lord. As I close in prayer, I want you to know that 
that God loves you and he wants to see the very best in your life. And God wants to see you reach souls for his glory. The harvest is plenty. The harvest is plenty and the workers are few. Father, this morning, God, as we close this service, Father, Lord, as we as individuals walk out of this sanctuary, God, Father, let us go in the joy and the peace of knowing that you are our Lord and Savior, God. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that if there is someone here, God, that does not know you, that before they leave, Lord, that they receive you into their heart. Lord, I pray, God, if there's someone here this morning, Lord, that is struggling with their walk, then, Lord, before they walk out, Lord, they ask for a stronger walk with you, Lord. And, Father, if there's anyone here, Lord, that we feel like that the words that were spoken this morning, God, were true, Lord, rehearse it in their hearing, Father. Let your yeas be yeas, and amen, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's children say, amen. God bless you this morning. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I just wanted to get the message across this morning that as our praise team comes, they're gonna close us out in a song. But I want you to have an awesome, awesome Memorial Day.